Hey there, folks. Welcome back. We're going to pick up with the second part here on the introductory monuments and memory lectures. Uh, we talked about some key terms and concepts. Now we're going to move into some key metaphors that can help us think through monuments and memory. This first one that we want to talk about is memorial as a text. Now, arguably, constructing the human-built landscape can be like writing words on a page. Although it may not always have literal words on a page, like the historical marker we saw of the Como Harriet street line, it still tells us something about who has the power to create and change the landscape, whether there are words involved or not. The monuments that we build and the memorials that we commemorate uh, tell us whose histories, heritages, and memories are considered valuable enough to be commemorated in the first place. Uh, they ask, or they prompt us to ask questions about what's said or not said about the past through these monuments. To what extent does the silence, does a monument silence certain parts of the past while giving voice to others, right? We mentioned earlier that monu monument building is, is about making choices about who, that, who we create and who we leave out uh, when commemorating the past. Okay, it also prompts us to ask the question, does the different treatment of histories and memories tell us something about power relations and patterns of inequality in historical and contemporary societies. This is a theme that you'll see come up time and again in this course is to think about power relations and patterns of inequality. Whose story gets told through the past? Okay, or sorry, who, whose story about the past gets told through how and who we commemorate? In this writing process, we can, uh, thinking about the the landscape as a text that we write on. This writing process is often dynamic. It's often a back and forth process of debate that's subject to, to rewriting and overwriting and erasing. Um, and so we want to think carefully in this class about, uh, first of all, who has the pen? <laughs> who, who has an opportunity to write at all? And second of all, how that story gets written in the memorial landscape who it commemorates, who it valorizes, and who it maybe silences or leaves out. Okay, so we can think about the memorial as a text that tells a story. And as an example of this, if we take a look at um, an example from your Smashing Statues text at the Birmingham Confederate Soldiers and Sailors Monument, now, this is not the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in St. Paul that I mentioned. This, again, is from your text. Um, this is a monument that, that was built in 1905 and survived until 2020. It's a monument that was erected by the United Confederate Veterans during a time of interracial labor organizing um, in, in Birmingham. Uh, Birmingham, actually, as a city itself, was not even established during the Civil War but it does have this monument to Confederate soldiers and sailors. It was removed, um, like I said, in the year 2020. So the place where this monument lives has a story, holds a story, and it tells us something about the past. It's, it's rights, so to speak, um, a story about the past, even though it, it may not physically have words on it. The monument itself stands as a story or as a text that we as you know citizens of society who live in places where monuments are uh, can read and understand even though we read and understand and interpret them differently we nonetheless we read this monument as if it is a text okay so that's one key sort of uh, metaphor that i wanted to cover the other one is Thinking about memorials, or another one is thinking about memorials as arenas. Okay, so on the one hand, yes, memorials are texts which communicate something to us. But they're also arenas as um, places that are involved in political struggles and debates and battles, if you will, over monuments and memorials' meanings. So Thinking of memorials as arenas emphasizes this role they play in political struggles and debates. Let's see if I can, yeah. Uh, people's ability to commemorate the past in certain ways is limited by competition and conflict with other people wishing to narrate the past in a different way. 
Okay, so again, we're emphasizing this struggle over who has the ability to write the story. The potential ensuing struggle and contest over whose conception of the past will prevail constitutes what we often call in the literature the politics of memory, the politics of commemoration. Okay, in this respect, monuments and memorials are places for social actors and groups to debate and negotiate the right to decide what is remembered and what version of the past will be made public, made visible to the public. And texts can also be arenas. Just because a monument is one metaphor doesn't mean it can't be more than one. Texts can also be arena, an arena. And we'll see this um, as we discuss the Birmingham monument a little bit more and the, the chapter in the Smashing Statues text. It tells both this story of um, the monument's sort of development and evolution over time, but then it also tells the battle that ultimately led to this monument being removed and no longer existing in the space that it does now. Okay, But if monuments are arenas, they're often places where these struggles and, and fights take place. Um, those fights could be literal, physical, in the case of uh, Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. They may not be. You know, an, an arena can be a place for a, a debate, a stage for debate that is nonviolent, as we hope all debates are nonviolent, right? Um, but in this case, you know, this is a particularly poignant case as, you know, unfortunately, the response, uh, the, the white supremacist rally that took place there and the response to it led ultimately to the death of, of Heather Heyer, a counter-protester to the Unite the Right rally um, in 2017. And sometimes, you know, these memorial arenas do turn physical um, towards the monuments themselves. The monuments may be ripped down by force, by community, um, as part of their participation in the memorial arena, if you will. So an arena is another metaphor that we can use to think about these memorials. Another one is memorial as performance. So you can think about memorial landscapes as stages for public dramas, rituals, historic reenactments, marches and protests, pageants and festivals, right? I showed you the Confederate festival in Brazil. I showed you the um, candlelight ritual that took place at George Floyd Square. These are all examples of performances. Um, and as part of thinking about memorials as performances, we can think about memor the memorial landscape and monuments themselves as constituted, shaped, and you know, made resonant and relevant to communities through bodily performance and the display of collective memories through the physical use of bodies in space. Um, and this emphasizes the body itself actually as a site of commemoration. And with it, you know, the, the feelings, emotions, and affect generated in and through places of memory and performance at or with those places. So, um, you know, memorial landscapes take on meanings through the performances that happen there and through the way that people use their bodies in these spaces. Uh, some scholars have even called memorials as archives of public affect or repositories of feeling because of the intense public or, or um, collective attachment, I should say, to these monuments and memorials and the landscapes uh, surrounding them. One example I'll also briefly just mention is this Madres del uh, de Plaza de Mayo in La Plata, Argentina. This is from the 1970s, and this is a group of women who would, on, if I remember correctly, a weekly or, or daily even basis, would march on the public plaza uh, to commemorate the atrocities committed under the dictatorship um, at that time in the 19, uh, 1970s. And these mothers, uh, these women and, and mothers were doing this march on the plaza um, in memory of children abducted and killed by the formerly oppressive Argentine government, forcing the country to try to come to terms publicly with its troubled past. Through the bodily performances of these mothers, such as doing things like, you know, wearing uh, white scarves, for example, 
or um, you know physically embodying the space. Um, the white scarves actually represented the diapers of the lost children. And these ordinary plazas become converted into emotionally and politically charged memorials where the body with the scarf on it becomes the site for commemoration as well as for political expression, self-expression, individual and collective uh, expression. So uh, this is a particularly powerful, I think, instance of when bodily performance takes on this uh, incredible commemorative meaning and capacity. And the last metaphor that I'll touch on here is memorial as wound and as wound dressing. Um, memorials are both wounded places and sites for addressing or dressing those collective and personal wounds. And uh, there's a whole body of, of academic literature on what it means to be a wounded place. But wounded places are essentially places that have been harmed and structured unjustly by unreconciled historical legacies of, of physical destruction, of displacement, of individual and collective social trauma, sometimes as a result of state sanctioned violence. Uh, so we can think of, you know, George Floyd Square, for example, as embodying that, that uh, wounded place by representing the state sanctioned violence of um, police killing. Of, of George Floyd and of African Americans in particular. Okay, so memorials can be this this site that holds these deep community wounds, and we refer to these places as uh, wounded places. Wounded places can also, you know, refer to colonization, can refer to gentrification and displacement, any other kind of destruction that took place there that. Um, has not been, you know, fully processed or, or healed from yet by a community. But the reclamation and transformation of these places of harm uh, can arguably allow these same sites to actually play a role in healing from that harm, which is why we refer to them as both wounds and wound dressing, because they play this critical role in both addressing the wound and actually dressing or mending the wound itself by going to and revisiting these places of harm and performing rituals, uh, laying of wreaths and flowers, having song and dance and public speakers come, right? Communities can then start to heal from the process or heal from the violence and the harm that um, characterized or has characterized places as wounded for an extended period of time. Right? And, and you've seen various kinds of capacity building, uh, memory work, if you will, activities that also create uh, wound dressing. Okay, so memorials can be both a wound and a wound dressing. You can think of this raised fist with the flag here as a form of, of protest, of course, and also a place of, of reclam reclamation as people lay wreaths in and around it and light candles and remember others who are also killed by the same type of violence, um, these places can, can continue to participate in the process of dressing or mending a wound uh, and hopefully healing from it someday. That concludes the explanation of these metaphors that I wanted to cover. If you'd like to take your time with some of these concepts and read them a little bit more slowly, um, this lecture was drawn from an encyclopedia entry that I helped to co-write in the Encyclopedia of Human Geography, and I'll post that in, in Moodle for you to take a look uh, as well if you'd like to, to take your time with some of these concepts and reread them.